the words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians in chapter 6 and verse 18. The 18th verse in the 6th chapter of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication. I stop the reading at that point because I don't propose to go any further than that this morning, but the apostle goes on to say, supplication for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We confine ourselves, I say, rather to this more general instruction with regard to prayer, praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication, etc. Now, the Apostle here comes to his last statement with respect to what we have to do as God's people in this matter of our fight and conflict and struggle with the devil and the principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and the spiritual wickedness in high or in heavenly places. That's what he's dealing with. As Christians, we are set in this conflict. Our blessed Lord, when he was here in the flesh, was in the same conflict. He was tempted in all points like as we are. The devil assailed him, and all these powers were used against him. And the very fact that we are Christian means that we are inevitably involved in this kind of fight and of conflict. Nothing is more fatal than to start in the Christian life with the notion that now, because we are Christian, we're finished with all our difficulties and troubles and problems. That's far from being the truth. Indeed, it's almost the antithesis of the truth. The New Testament rather gives the impression that because we are Christians, we must expect attacks upon us in a way that we'd never known or realized before. But, thank God, we are not only told that we have to wrestle and fight in this way, we are told how we can be enabled to do so successfully. And that's what the Apostle deals with here from verse 10 to the end of this paragraph. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And take unto you the whole armor of God. God provides us with the strength and with this armor that is so essential to engage in this battle. And we've been working our way through the various pieces and portions of the armor that is provided for us. Having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, taking the shield of faith, the shield of faith wherewith ye may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And now he goes on, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Now, what is the meaning of this further and final exhortation? Well, of course, nothing is more important here than the connection. What's the relationship of this praying always? to what he has been dealing with hitherto. And the point we make is, of course, that this is not a further or an additional piece of armor. Some have taken it to mean that, that he's still dealing with the whole armor of God and says, now the next piece, the final piece, is prayer. But that seems to me to be entirely wrong for were it merely for this good reason. That in all the other cases in dealing with the pieces of the armor. He has followed his own analogy carefully and closely. He's looking in his mind at a Roman soldier and he takes the various pieces of armor that was worn by such a soldier and he names them. He mentions, as we've seen, that you have to start with this kind of girdle and that you have to put on a breastplate. You have to have the sandals you have to have the shield, you have to have the helmet, and you have to have the sword. 
But there's no mention of any portion of armor here. And that in and of itself, it seems to me, is sufficient to decide the whole matter. He's finished with his analogy about the armor. He's described six pieces of armor. And that is the total picture as regards the analogy concerning the whole armor of God. Moreover, of course, there is no reference here to any particular part of the body, nor indeed to the body as a whole. So that it isn't an additional piece of armor. Neither is it, as some have suggested, just a kind of further elaboration of the sword. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, that you may use the sword of the Spirit by praying in the Spirit. That seems to me, again, to be an entirely artificial mode of interpretation. Well, what is it, then? What is the connection? Well, surely it is this, that this is something that we have to do and to go on doing in connection with the whole of the armor. Indeed, with the whole of our position as Christians and in our conflict against the world and the flesh and the devil. He says, now you take these various separate parts and portions of the armor and you put them on and put them on carefully and use them in the way described. But in addition to all that, always and at all times and in every circumstance, keep on praying. In other words, I'm suggesting that there are uh, two hymns which give us what I would regard at any rate as the correct interpretation of the connection between the prayer and the whole armor of God. One of the hymns puts it like this. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. That's it. As you put on each piece, do so in a prayerful manner. Do so with prayer. Each piece put on with prayer. And the other hymn puts it like this. To keep your armor bright, attend with constant care, still walking in your captain's sight and watching unto prayer. Both those clearly have been inspired by this verse that we are looking at together this morning. And I believe that their interpretation is perfectly sound and perfectly right. Each piece put on with prayer. In fact, everything that we've got, that we have to do, uh, must be done in this spirit and attitude of constant prayer. What does it mean then? Well, of course, it means this. That the armor which is provided for us by God cannot be used except in fellowship and communion with God. That's the point that he is making. The armor that God provides for us must never be thought of mechanically, still less magically. Now, that's the danger, that's the temptation, to feel that as long as you're provided with this armor, and you put on this armor, well, there's no more to be done, that everything is all right, that the armor will in and of itself protect you, that it does so mechanically, inevitably, almost in a magical manner, so that having put it on, you can relax and everything's going to be all right. Well, now that's the exact opposite of the uh, true position, says the great apostle. If you do that, you're already uh, defeated. The honor and the spiritual application of it that we've been working out together must always be conceived of and thought of in a vital manner, in a living manner, and in a spiritual manner. Every single piece and portion excellent though it is in itself, will not suffice us and will not avail us, unless always and at all times we are in this relationship to God and receiving strength and power from him. Now, this is a very important point, of course, for this reason. Look at the things we've been considering. Having our loins girt about with truth, this great and glorious truth about salvation as a whole and in general. What's more wonderful than that? Breastplate of righteousness. Seeing clearly this great doctrine of justification by faith only, proving that we see it by a righteous life and righteous living. Nothing excessive can be said about that. Feet 
shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You remember the full meaning of that. This shield of faith and all the wonderful things that it can do. Helmet of salvation, that blessed hope. There's nothing beyond these things and the sword of the Spirit. And yet, what the apostle is telling us here is this, that having all that, we may still fail and be utterly defeated. In other words, you can't rely even upon these things in and of themselves. And imagine that because you have them, that you have everything, and that you can never fall and never fail. Let me put that then in a different form. What the apostle is telling us here is this, that even orthodoxy is not enough. We must be orthodox. We must have the whole armor of God. We are hopeless if we haven't got it. You can't fight the devil with philosophy. You can't fight him with idealism. You can't fight him with anything but with the truth of God, which is provided for us. But the point is that you can't even fight him with that if you are attempting to do so in your own strength and in your own power. Now, this is where the thing becomes so desperately urgent for us. There is such a thing as a dead orthodoxy. It is possible for a Christian to be perfectly orthodox and yet to be defeated and to be living a defeated and a useless life. He understands the truth with his mind. He knows it. He's got it. He can point out the errors in other, other people's teaching. And yet his life is of no value to anybody. Because he's being defeated by the devil. He perhaps has become intellectually proud of his knowledge, his intellectual understanding and apprehension of the scriptures. He's already a very defeated man. And so on with every other aspect of this whole armor of God that we've been considering together. A mere intellectual acquaintance with the truth, though it is absolutely essential, is not sufficient. If we stop at that, we are, I say, already defeated. And the same thing applies, of course, to a church or to a group of churches or a denomination of churches. There have been in the history of the church churches which have been thoroughly orthodox, but which seem to be utterly ineffective, useless from the standpoint of evangelism and bringing men and women to a knowledge of the truth, not counting in their area, not counting in their country. It is possible for people to be perfectly orthodox and yet quite useless. Why? Well, because so often they've got this false, mechanical, almost magical view of the value of the whole armor of God. They say, but we've got it on. We're all right. We are clear about this, that, and the other. They've started with the girdle of truth and they've gone on to all the others and they're able to use as they think the sword of the Spirit and yet they're not using it in the right way because they're paralyzed by the devil. Somehow or another, their possession of the truth does not seem to be of active value in their work and operations as the church of God. A most solemn thought is a most serious thing. It could be illustrated, as I say, from the long history of the church. It could be illustrated from the story of the church even at this present time. There is nothing so tragic as to see a dead Orthodox church. And the explanation always is that they've forgotten this further exaltation. Having put on each single piece of the armor carefully and thoroughly, they haven't gone on to remember this injunction, praying always. It's an appalling thing, this, the most alarming thing that I know of, and alarming perhaps especially to those of us who are theologically inclined. But it does often happen that people who are most orthodox are the ones who realize least the value of prayer. I have known Christian people who've been well acquainted with the theology of the Bible and have known it in an extraordinary manner, but who didn't seem to believe in prayer meetings, who didn't seem to see the utter absolute necessity of praying always in the way that is indicated here by the great apostle. Now, this is where the devil comes in, you see, and he so concentrates our attention on one thing that we entirely forget the other. But we mustn't. We must follow the apostle and go on as he leads us on. What he means is this, then, that everything must be done in a spiritual manner. 
Everything must be brought to life. Everything must be quickened by the Spirit. If it isn't, it's of no value. The letter killeth, the Spirit giveth life. And we can turn even this glorious doctrine of salvation into a merely another kind of legalism or scholasticism. And the moment we do that, we are already defeated by the devil. No, no. There must always be this living quality, this power, this ability to use what God provides for us. In other words, I'm suggesting that what the apostle is really saying in this verse is what he's already said in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He started with it, but he knows us so well. He knows how we tend to concentrate on the last thing we've heard. And he's had to go on to tell us about the whole armor of God and the particular parts and portions. And he knows that many a man is likely to say, very well, this is the thing that matters. And he forgets the thing with which the apostle started, so he brings it in again, praying always. That's the way to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It is to be always praying with all prayer and supplication and so on, in the Spirit. In other words, we are utterly dependent upon God and upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must realize that if we don't remain in constant contact and communion with them, whatever we may have done by way of putting on the armor will avail us nothing. We must ever maintain this essential, intimate relationship with God. In other words, what he's saying is that prayer is essential. Now, haven't you noticed the place that is given to prayer in the New Testament? It's a remarkable thing, this. It's there everywhere. Look at it in the life of our Lord himself. Here he is, son of God. Here he is with all the knowledge that he possessed and displayed to the amazement of the Pharisees and scribes and others. And yet you look at the frequency with which he turned aside to pray to God. He'd spend a whole night in prayer. He'd rise a great while before dawn in order to pray to God and keep this communion. He found that it was essential. And so it's not surprising that he should have taught his people in the words that we read just now that men should always pray and not faint. It's the only way to avoid fainting. It's the only alternative to fainting. We must always pray and not faint. So I ask a question at this point. What is the place of prayer in your life and mine? What prominence does it have in our lives? It's a question that comes to everybody. It's a question that is as necessary to the man who is well versed in the scriptures and who has a knowledge of its doctrine and its theology as it is to anybody else. It's a question that comes to everybody. Where does prayer come in our lives? What part does it play? How essential is it to us? Do we realize that without it we faint? Do we rely upon it? Do we practice it in the way that the apostle indicates here? There can be no question at all. And the lives of the saints throughout the centuries confirm this to the very hilt. Our ultimate position as Christians is tested by the character of our prayer life. More important than knowledge and understanding. Oh, don't imagine I'm detracting from that. I spend most of my life in showing the importance of having a knowledge of truth and understanding. It is incomparably important. There's only one thing that's more important, and that is this. You see, we can put it like this. The ultimate test of my understanding of the scriptural teaching is the amount of time I spend in prayer. Theology, knowledge of God. So the more I know theology, the more it ought to drive me to seek to know God. Not to know about him, but to know him. The whole object of salvation is to bring me to a knowledge of God. I may talk learnedly about regeneration, but what is eternal life? It is that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. If all my knowledge doesn't lead me to prayer, there's something wrong somewhere. It's meant to do that. 
The value of the knowledge is that it gives me such a better understanding that I ought to be able to pray better than anybody else. And if it doesn't lead to that, well, there's something wrong and spurious about it, or else I am handling it in a wrong manner, and that is the trouble. I am convinced the trouble is that we stop at putting on the whole armor of God. Here we are complete. We are defenders of the faith. We understand all things. And as I say, the devil puffs us up with our knowledge and thereby defeats us. Very well, let's follow the apostle as he gives us some detailed instruction and teaching with regard to this whole matter of prayer. You see, though he's finishing his epistle, he's bound to enter still into details. What a wise man this was. What a profound teacher he was. He doesn't say, he doesn't leave it just as this, praying always. That's how we tend to do it, isn't it? No, no, he knows us. He knows our defects. He knows our ignorance. He knows we need to be taught in detail, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance. Still, he goes on teaching, even at the very end of his letter. Well, let's follow him. What is his teaching with regard to prayer, true prayer? Well, we can divide it perhaps into general and particular. Here is his general instruction. We may call it, if you like, the form of prayer, as distinct from the spirit of prayer. Pray. There's the general term. Uh, well, uh, what kind of prayers are there? How do we pray? He subdivides it, you notice, into two sections. He divides it into pr all prayer and, secondly, supplication. So that from the more or less formal, mechanical standpoint, you think of prayer in those two ways. All prayer and supplication. Now, what does he mean by this division? What does he mean by all prayer? Praying always with all prayer. Well, that means uh, partly prayer in general. Everything that you put under the heading of prayer. But it doesn't mean that only. He really means this, that we should pray Always with all forms of prayer, all kinds of prayer, if you like. You should pray in private, you should pray in public. All prayer, every kind of prayer. There is secret prayer, there's closet prayer. There's that lonely, isolated prayer, and we should always be engaged in it. Yes, but not only that, he says, there's public prayer, there is church prayer, there is common prayer, there is praying together, as you read of the early Christians doing in the book of the Acts of the Apostles private and public. But then there is another kind of division. Sometimes one prays in words, an oral prayer. But you needn't always use words in order to pray. You can pray without actually uttering words. It can be unexpressed as well as oral. And he says, indulge in all you see, you needn't of necessity get down on your knees when you pray. You can pray when you're walking along a street. You sometimes do it in words, but then as you're walking along the street and temptation or something may come, you can be praying. You are, can be praying in your mind and in your heart and in your spirit. And then another way you can divide it, if you like, is this. Prayer sometimes is... A formal in the sense that it's orderly. Take the order of the Lord's Prayer, for instance. There's an obvious order there, and a design and an arrangement. And that is true of so many of the great prayers that we find in the Bible. And we should pray like that. Our prayers are to be intelligent. It is right that there should be a certain amount of order and a formal arrangement in our prayers. Quite all right. But that's not the only form of prayer. There's another type of prayer that can be equally valuable, equally efficacious. Sometimes it's just an ejaculation. Sometimes just a groan, a cry from the heart. The Spirit maketh intercession in us, says Paul, with groanings which cannot be uttered. They're our groanings. The Spirit doesn't need to groan. It's we who do the groaning. And that, that sometimes that's all your prayer is. It's just a sigh, it's just a groan, it's an oh. Read the prayers of people like Isaiah. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens. That oh, it's sometimes just an ejaculation. Well now, what the apostle is saying is this. 
pray in all ways and in all manners, all forms and kinds of prayer, he says. Be at it always. But then he specifies a certain type of prayer in particular. And of course in his context this is obviously necessary. Supplication. What does he mean here? Well, now here he comes to the very definite part of prayer which we call petition. I haven't time to go into this in detail as I'd like to. Indeed, we've already done it in earlier parts of this great epistle. Let me just uh, concentrate on this point then by saying that this means prayer with regard to special requests and desires. All prayer, every form, and not only that, every type, adoration and worship and praise and thanksgiving. And then you come to your requests. That's the idea that the apostle has got here. He always seems to adopt this same classification. You remember how he does it in writing to the Philippians in chapter 4, where he puts it like this in verses 6 and 7, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. That's virtually the same thing. So that in this kind of general prayer, which we must always be praying and offering, he says in particular also, you've got to bring these supplications, these particular petitions, and keep on doing that. In the fight, as you see your several needs arising, as you see the needs of others and so on, well, in all these different ways, be free, he says, and pray in general, pray in particular. Bring your petitions, let your requests be made known unto the Lord. Now, we leave it at that. That's the general instruction which he gives us here with regard to prayer. But let's concentrate on this next section. What I venture to call the secret of true prayer. And the secret of true prayer is found in three words. In the Spirit. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Now here's a vital point. Here is the real essence, the very life and spirit of prayer. Again, it's something that we find repeated and emphasized constantly in the Scripture. We've already met it in this epistle in the second chapter and verse 18. For through him, says the apostle, referring to our Lord, We both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. That's it. The Spirit comes in in prayer in that vital manner. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, we both have access by one, the one and only Spirit, unto the Father. He's uh, dealt with the same point in writing to the Romans in chapter 8, you remember, and in verse 26. His theme there is just the same. That we are in a world of trials and of sufferings and of temptations. He reminds them and is glad to do so that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. But it's very difficult all the same. We ourselves, which are the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. We are saved by hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. We haven't yet got it. We only see it as in a glass darkly. We see it distantly by faith. What a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that, we see not. Then do we with patience wait for it. That's the position of the Christian in this world. Persecuted and tried and tempted, all these things surrounding him. But he says, listen, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And again you've got the same idea in Philippians 3, 3, where Paul describes a Christian. He says, this is a Christian. We are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit, or by the Spirit, or in Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. The emphasis is upon that we worship God, unlike those Jews and Judaizers, we worship God in the Spirit. 
And likewise, you have the same teaching in the teaching of the Apostle Jude, where he puts it like this, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That's the 20th verse in the epistle of Jude. Now then, why does he add this? Why doesn't he just leave it at saying that we are to be praying always with all prayer and supplication? Why does he add, in the Spirit, as he does in those other places and as Jude does? Well, here to me is the vital point about prayer. And the addition is as vital as this, that if we don't remember it, well, we don't really pray. Praying, he says, yes, but not merely in the ways that I've told you, whether audibly or inaudibly, or standing or kneeling or whatever you may do. These are not the important things, says Paul. Of course, they're essential and they have their place. There is to be order even in this matter. But above all, he says, do it in the Spirit. What's he mean? Well, he means that vain repetitions are not praying. That was a trouble again, wasn't it, with the Pharisees and others? Vain repetitions. Much speaking. They thought they were heard because of that. That's how they judged and evaluated a prayer by its length and so on. And, uh, well, this is something which you can see opens out a great field. The whole question of liturgy is involved here. You see, you can repeat it mechanically, reading the same prayers or reciting them from memory Sunday after Sunday. It's not confined to the liturgical parts of the church. We can be guilty of the same thing. We can indulge in vain repetitions, merely uttering words. We can do so privately. We can do so publicly. We can pray out of mere habit and out of mere custom because we believe it's right to say our prayers morning and evening. We do so. But my dear friend, so often it isn't praying at all. You're uttering words. You're not praying in the spirit. And true prayer is prayer that is in the Spirit. It's the opposite, you see, of relying upon forms. Relying upon ritual. Don't listen to those Judaizers, says Paul to the Philippians. They'll tell you that you can only worship in a temple. They'll tell you that you can only worship as long as you go through certain forms and ceremonies and ritual. That these things are essential. Don't listen to them, he says. We are the circumcision that worship God in the spiritual way, in the spirit. Theirs is mechanical, it's external, it's formal. It's not real prayer. And you see the need of this exhortation, this addition in the spirit? There are people to whom certain types of building are essential before they can pray. They say, of course, the Catholic section of the church pays more attention to worship than does nonconformity. What they really mean by that is that they've got certain types of building and stained glass windows and that they have certain forms and ceremonies. And they think that that's worship. And of course, if you don't kneel in prayer, it's terrible. The mere posture is to them the great thing and the vital thing. It isn't to the apostle. It's whether your spirit is bent. It's whether you're in the spirit that matters. This is the contrast. This is the negative. It doesn't mean all that, says the apostle. Or let me put it like this, praying in the Spirit is the opposite of cold, heartless, formal prayers. There is nothing that so appalls me as to hear sometimes in a service, religious service on the wireless or television, as to hear people talking about saying a prayer. Or you'll read about a man, I remember reading about a man visiting a certain city, and he said he suddenly saw a cathedral, and I went in, he said, and said a prayer, and then he went on looking round, saying a prayer. That seems to me to be the opposite of praying in the Spirit. Or still worse, when you get the man whose deportment is perfect, he's been trained, and he comes to a part of the service and he says, now a prayer. Now a prayer. That's the antithesis of praying in the Spirit. Saying a prayer. Now a prayer. The glibness, the slickness, the ease of it all. 
I find it very difficult not to say that such, in my estimate, is nothing but blasphemy. It's the antithesis of praying in the Spirit. You see, it means that you're not praying with your mind only. You can pray with your mind, and it can be a very correct prayer. It can be a very beautiful prayer. I never liked that description of a prayer. That's why I never liked printed prayers. It seems to me to be a negation of this thing the Apostle's talking about. A beautiful prayer. As if a man's diction and language when he's addressing the Almighty is the important thing. No, no, it isn't merely intellectual. Though it be perfectly correct and doctrinally correct, that doesn't make it really prayer. And you may pray for the right things and still it isn't this. Well, what is this then? Are you simply advocating, says someone, that he means praying from the heart, emotional prayer? No, I don't mean that either. And I don't think this does mean that. What does it mean then? Well, it doesn't refer to our spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. This means that the Holy Spirit uh, directs the prayer, creates the prayer within us, and empowers us to offer it and to pray it. We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us. He does it in us. He gives us the petitions. He orders our mind in such a way. He gives the prayer, he directs it, and he empowers it. Now, I think there's an important point here. Let me call your attention to it. I don't think the thing the apostle has in his mind is the thing that he's teaching in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 14 and 15. Listen to this. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Now, I'm suggesting that that isn't the thing the Apostle has in his mind here in this verse in Ephesians, for this reason. That in 1 Corinthians 14, he is dealing with a kind of ecstatic prayer. You see, now you notice that he contrasts it with the understanding. I will pray with the Spirit, I will pray with the understanding also. Here is a man in that state of ecstasy which was so common in the early church and is still known when a man filled with the Spirit is lifted up and out of himself. And he utters things that are not controlled for the moment by his understanding. That's what the apostle is dealing with in 1 Corinthians 14. But I don't think that that's the contrast here. The contrast here is the contrast between that which is merely formal and that which is indicted and inspired and led by the Holy Spirit himself. What does this mean in practice? How does one pray in the Holy Spirit? And God knows at this point I find myself more hesitant than I've ever been in a pulpit or ever can be in a pulpit. I'm never happy about people's books on prayer. It's so easy to produce a formal treatise on prayer, but to pray in the Holy Spirit. How much do we know about this? I think it means something like this. Thank God I know this much about it that I can say certain things about it. Would that I knew more. It means that a man must be in the Spirit himself. But you say, surely a man who's got the Holy Spirit in him is always in the Spirit. No, he isn't. You remember that the Apostle John tells us that he himself was in the Spirit on the Lord's day on that island of Patmos when he received the revelation which we have in our Bibles. I, John, he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. It was something very special then. The Spirit is always in us, but we are not always in the Spirit. And the first thing we have to do when we begin to pray is to make sure that we are in the Spirit. In other words, we've got to prepare ourselves for prayer. We've got to recollect what we are doing. We've got to become spiritually minded. You don't rush off a prayer. You don't merely express your petitions. You don't merely content with yourself that you spend a certain amount of time on your knees. No, you've got to be 
spiritually minded. You've got to be in the realm of the spirit, and that takes effort, and it involves discipline. It means you've got to shut out certain things. You've got to be calm and quiet, and you've got to have peace. And you've got to submit yourself utterly to the Holy Spirit and allow him to lead you and to guide you and to direct you. Putting yourself into the Spirit. How often do we do this, my friends? This is praying in the Spirit. You can do all the other. It isn't praying in the Spirit. So we have to do this recollection. It was a term that was used by the fathers and by the saints. Recollection. And it's essential. You can't pray in the Spirit without it. Very well, then it goes on to this. It means that you have to realize your one and only way of approach and entry into the presence of God. You don't assume it, you remind yourself of it again. There's only one way to approach God, that is, in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit will always lead us to him, and we'll realize it. And you should never pray without having this deep consciousness of your utter dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ and his work. Seeing, therefore, that we have a great high priest that is passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly unto the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's praying in the Spirit. If your heart isn't warmed by thinking of the Lord Jesus when you pray, you're not praying in the Spirit. The Spirit always brings us to that. Always brings us to that realization that we enter into the holiest of all only by the blood of Jesus. And the moment you realize that your heart is melted and is warmed, something happens to you that's praying in the Spirit. You see, the, the formality is finished with. And now you're in this spiritual condition. You have to realize your right of approach and you're unable to do so with a holy boldness. And that in turn leads to this. A realization of the presence of God. That great and saintly man, George Muller, who knew so much more about prayer than most of us, he, in talking to ministers about this very matter of prayer, laid great emphasis upon that. He said he never came to his requests and his petitions until he'd got an active and a living realization of the presence of God. What is prayer? Well, it's fellowship, it's communion. Our fellowship is with the Father, says John, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. But you see, you don't have fellowship if you don't realize the other person is there. You must realize the presence. There's no real fellowship. You can be making statements to God, but that's not praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit means that you're having Fellowship with God, you know he is listening, you know he is there. Realization of the presence of God. The Spirit always brings that. And we must be content with nothing less. And that, of course, ends in true worship, in adoration, in prayer. And in us, it's characterized by warmth of spirit, freedom. Is there anything on earth which is more wonderful than freedom in prayer. Don't you delight in it? Don't you rejoice in it? When you're suddenly given freedom, you may have been struggling in prayer, finding it difficult to concentrate, finding it difficult to gather your mind, finding it difficult, as it were, to make contact. Suddenly there's a freedom given. Or haven't you noticed it in public prayer? You've been stumbling, you've been halting, you've been praying as you should with your mind, you've been using your order, you've been... Gathering your petitions, it's all right, we must do that, but that's only the framework, that's the scaffolding, and you don't stop with that. And suddenly the Spirit comes, and you're taken out of yourself, and the words pour out of you, and you know that you're speaking to him, and there is an exchange taking place. You're in the realm of the Spirit, and enjoying the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's praying in the Spirit. Anybody who knows anything of this by experience, We'll know exactly what it is, how difficult to put it in words. I can look back by the grace of God, and I thank him for it, to two public prayer meetings in which I was present when this was experienced in an unusual manner. I shall never forget it as long as I live. 
I remember a prayer meeting starting one night at 7.15 in a church in South Wales. Hot summer's evening on a Monday night. Two men took part in prayer. All right, it was praying. Yes, I'll grant you. Then a man got up, whom we all knew so well. Somewhat unimportant men, not a gifted man by any means. A man whose prayers could be stilted and formal and dry and discouraging. He began to pray, and suddenly something happened to him. The old man was transformed. His voice deepened. He began to pour out one of the most eloquent things I've ever heard in the whole of my life. And he lifted the whole place up, myself included, every one of us. We were in the spirit and in the realm of the spirit. And on and on it went, one after another. Men whom I'd heard, women whom I'd heard praying, praying as I'd never heard them before. Language, thought, everything perfect, warmth, freedom, liberty. And on and on it went until about ten to ten. We'd forgotten time. Of course, we were in the realm of the Spirit. We were in eternity. Time didn't matter. Nothing mattered. You see, that's what you get in revivals. Thank God I say I've known that kind of thing twice. But my friends, that's the thing the Apostle is exhorting us to. Formal prayers are not enough with the world and the church as they are today. We need this praying in the Spirit. We need to lay hold on God to use those expressive dramatic words of the prophet Isaiah. Lay hold on him. And you'll never lay hold on him unless you're in the spirit. Formal prayers, red prayers. These are not the ways of laying hold upon God. But if you're in the spirit, you will. That's what he enables us to do. And our hearts are warmed. And we have this glorious liberty and freedom that the spirit alone can give. Very well. That's the most important part about prayer. Is anything real prayer? I wonder about that. Yes, I thank God it is. I believe he honors our intentions, poor and unworthy though they are, but let's not rest on that. Let's try to learn how to pray in the Spirit. And once you've known it, you'll be content with nothing else. You'll feel everything else is a failure and has fallen short to be taken up by the Spirit, to know he's illuminating your mind and moving your heart, giving you freedom of utterance, liberty of expression, understanding of things in the spiritual realm. That's the thing we need. And as we have it, we'll fight this enemy and be more than conqueror. And then he ends by saying, keep on at it, always, at every time, on every occasion, at all seasons, Pray without ceasing, he says to the Thessalonians. That's what he's saying here, in a sense. Praying always. Not now and again. Not simply when you're in trouble. Not simply when things are going wrong. Always. You're always in this business. Keep on. Always. Watching. Don't be asleep. Don't fall asleep. Keep awake. Be attentive. Be vigilant. Never be listless. Rouse yourself. Don't be slack. If you find you're neglecting prayer, take yourself to test. Always doing this. Watching there and to... And with all perseverance, keep on at it. Don't do it by fits and starts. Don't have spasms of praying. Be unremitting. Keep on and go on. Never quit, never cease praying. Men should always pray and not faint. Well, my dear friends, surely this is the greatest of all needs at the present time. Let's keep the order. You must have the whole armor of God. I'm not simply exhorting people to pray who don't know their truth, their doctrine. No, no. Put on the whole armor piece by piece, but put on each piece with prayer. To keep your armor bright, attend with constant care and watching in your captain's sight and watching unto prayer. That's it. Make it come alive. Let it burst into flame. Let your knowledge be illuminating. Let it lead to a knowledge of God that is indescribable because of its glory. Praying always in the Spirit. Amen. The closing hymn is hymn number 497. 497. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on Strong in the strength which God supplies through his eternal Son. 497.
him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. And may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now and until as conquerors in Christ we shall indeed arrive at home. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org. 